Hello and welcome to the Table Rush Talk Show. On this episode, we dive deep into the heart of healing and transformation. I'm your host, Misha, and today we're joined by the remarkable Sarah Bueno. Sarah is a therapist, consultant, and educator who's been on a profound journey of personal and professional evolution. After a decade of nurturing her practice, she took a bold step to slow down, address her workaholism, and refocus her mission. She ultimately sold, selling her business. We'll explore her unique insights into healing from white supremacy and addiction treatment, the impact of social structures on our lives, and the power of community in fostering change. Man, that's a, quite an intro. Join us for an enlightening conversation that challenges norms and invites growth. You know when someone is selling from stage and at the end, the audience gets up and rushes to the back of the room to buy? That's a table rush. My name is Misha Z, and the Table Rush Talk Show is all about bringing you the tools, strategies, and tactics that you can use to grow your audience and inspire them to buy. Welcome, everybody, to the Table Rush Talk Show. Today, I have Sarah Bueno, a therapist, consultant, and a teacher who offers leaders, groups, and organizations opportunities for transformation and evolution, or call it revolution, through heart-centered and business-minded practices. And she's also host of Conversations with a Wounded Healer podcast. And fun fact, she recently sold her practice that she had been building for 10 years. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Misha. Great to be here. Ah, fantastic. So um, let's just get right into it. Um, I think, why don't we start with, with, well, we had a conversation, I don't know, a week or two ago, and and we were just talking about life a little bit. And 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 you said, hey, an I'm... existential dread. <laughs> <laughs> yes, an existential mm-hmm. dread. Yeah. <laughs> which we're gonna get to. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that, good. My, <laughs> I said, Hey, what's your favorite thing to talk about? And you're like, Ooh, existential dread. <laughs> which is <laughs> one of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so well, we can dive into that in a minute, but um, you're sort of reinventing yourself again, um, right? Isn't that what yeah. you told me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So what's that look like for you right now? Maybe business-wise or, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I'll start with the personal and then extend it out to business because I think that's all. it's all related for me. Uh, I've been trying to slow my life down because in 2020, one of the things that I realized is that I was killing myself with the way that I was working. And I ended up going to a trauma treatment program. And one of the the things that came out of that was a recognition that I was, I was acting as if I was addicted to work. So I ended up going to Workaholics Anonymous for a couple years, learned so much about myself and my relationship to work in that process. And you know, through all this personal trauma work that I was doing, one of the things that my my therapist said was, you've now built the capacity to tolerate calm, which was like mind blowing. And I was like, oh, you're right. Because I was so used to like coming from a family that was really chaotic and emotionally laden. I was used to that being normal and it's not right. And so as I started healing my trauma, I'm I'm able to be calm and quiet. So uh, just last year, my husband and I moved from like right in the city of Chicago, just outside of it in this little suburb called Skokie. And I have quiet. It's so quiet here at night. The first night we came here and we were like going to bed, we were like, there's nothing. There's nothing there. It's so weird. There's no cars. There's no children screaming. There's no neighbors screaming or what, you know, whatever we would have heard in the city. And so slowing my life down meant I needed to sell my practice. And it was something I had already been moving towards anyway. When I hired my executive director, Rael Grayson, who then eventually bought the practice just this April in 2023, I told her, I'm done. <laughs> I really want to work myself out. And so if you are in it to win it, I I would love to sell the practice to you. And so that's what we ended up doing over time. And so, you know, part, part of 
being able to slow my life down was to not have so many people who needed me uh, so acutely, right? Because I, for for the longest time, I've had clients that are really stable, and yeah, every time, every once in a while, there's a crisis. Of course, I'm there for them, but generally, like my client caseload is very stable. But it was it was being a boss that was really emotionally labile, and there was just there was all you know, there's always something, right? Like mm-hmm. people are always having crises, and that's fine. And that was just something. I wasn't able to hold anymore in a way that I could still be true to myself and be the type of business owner that I wanted to be. And so with selling the practice, I'm sort of figuring out what is it that I want to do when I grow up and, and the, the end of the day, it's really, I want to help therapists heal. And I think our field is really, it's, it's rapidly changing right now. Like post COVID, everything is different where we are with the stage of capitalism, it's very different. Venture capital now recognizes mental health as a crisis. And so they have come in and tried to make a bunch of businesses so that they can make a bunch of money. There's there's just a lot of stuff that's different. And so I think my tools are not only good for, you know, having therapists as clients on an individual level, but also trying to support therapeutic organizations with some some culture healing, uh, because a lot of the places that we work are, you know, at best, uh, they're okay. And at worst they're toxic. And if your therapist is, you know, working in a toxic environment, they're not going to really be their best self in the therapy room. So I think that's where my impact is, is going to be. And I'm being very slow about it and sort of letting it unfold and evolve as it goes. Cause I, you know, I have the luxury of time now. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing where it goes, but I love, I love working with leaders and, and supporting people and be able in being able to support other people better. Cool. I love that. Thank you so much. There was so much great stuff packed in what you, in what you just said, but first off, if people want to find you and what you're up to now, sure. Yep. I'm looking at headheartbiztherapy.com. Yep. Is that? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Headheart Business Therapy. So headheartbiztherapy.com. I'm headheartbiztherapy on Instagram and Facebook too. Awesome. And then there, like when, when someone goes there right now, if someone were to follow along and go there, they mm-hmm. could see how you talk about uh, helping corporations with that. Uh, how did you say that you said therapeutic corporations? Is that what you said? Or did I write that down wrong? Or? I mean, it's it, it's funny that I have a reaction in my body when you say the word corporations, but that's exactly what they are. I mean, right now I'm working with small business owners. I'm not working with the venture capital sorts of companies, but uh, my the start of my, my therapeutic work was in the addictions field. And so a friend and I are also, we've, we've created a joint venture called the Sarah's cause her name is also Sarah. Okay. And we, re- we really want to help, uh, addiction organizations heal from white supremacy. So that'll probably be more of the sort of like corporate work. Cause there's a lot of very corporate type treatment centers, yeah. but, but my, my individual work with head heart business therapy so far has been with small business owners. Cool. Cool, cool. And so say, that was very specific what you said, help addiction, say that again, help addiction. Yeah. Addiction treatment centers heal from white supremacy. Uh, the the way that we have sort of, I guess, uh, spoken about the work, being addiction counselors, it's easy for us to recognize addiction in so many different places. And our culture is addicted to white supremacy, uh, you know, because what, right. Like what, <laughs> I see your smile. They're like, you know, white people, this is all we know. And often, you know, we don't see the, the racism and whatnot that people of color are seeing. And so it's like, it's sort of this addiction to culture as the way it is. And mm-hmm. if we really truly want liberation for all, everything's going to have to change. And we think that addiction counselors have a lot of unique skills that actually help heal from white supremacy. And so we sort of, we use the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and we've sort of, I guess, culturally appropriated them in, in order to talk about how we can heal from white supremacy. I love this. I was not expecting to go this direction, but I here we are. More. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> wow. Amazing. It's so Awesome! What happens if I shut my mouth? <laughs> right? Yeah, and it's it's better if I don't like tell you, but like plan what I'm gonna say. We'll just see yeah. what comes up. Yeah. So, um, I have deep roots in recovery, deep roots in Amazing. the Twelve Steps program myself. Yeah, and I'm 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 
it drives so much of what I do in my life. Like I'm, mm-hmm. you know, part of the reco- recovery modalities or 12 step modalities. Part of that is right. Getting rid of our selfishness and how can we be of service? Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm constantly trying to bring my thoughts. Like, how can I be of service? How can I be of right. service? What could I bring to the table? And, you know, I've got a, I've got the big book back there and I could quote the page where that came from. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. Just so I I love the I love what the what the 12 step modalities yeah are bringing to the to the world these yeah. days. Um just a side note there but but I'm I'm fascinated about how do you see like this addiction of white supremacy manifesting in in treatment centers or 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 broader like like speak to that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like in 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 addiction terms yeah yeah well so i'm trying to think off the top of my head i might have to google the actually let me pull up a presentation that we had done because that's probably the easiest way to do it but there are essentially like i don't know what the right word to use is right now but like tenants of white supremacy that are sort of always operating underneath um, Mm. that we're not always completely aware of. And and so when we look at the ways that that shows up and I mean, we just took specifically treatment centers because that's, Mm. you know, that's that's what we know. And that's the work that we've done um, and looked at the ways that it shows up in in those places. So let me just pull this up real quick. Sure. Yeah, and, our presentation is called Rehabil- "Rehabilitating Addiction Treatment: An Anti-Racist Recovery Approach." Cool, I love it. I, well, I was just thinking, you know, compulsively we do things, we have habits. So, as a white guy, obviously in his mid fifties, right. well, I should say young mid fifties, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm gonna have habits that I'm unaware of, right? right? I'm just automatically thinking about it that way, like. Hey, I've got habits, fallback positions. Uh, compulsively, I'll go back to it, probably in denial about a lot of it, completely unaware. I would also say, you know, when we're in the cycle of addiction, yep, I'm unaware of how I'm hurting the people around me. Precisely. Right. Precisely. And, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the. It's like, ooh, this learning opportunity. We don't need to dwell on this, but I'm just, as, yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I grew up. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I can read these real quick so that you can get a better idea of what they talk about. And uh, we took this from uh, uh, an author, Carolyn Griffith, who wrote Witnessing Whiteness and Reevaluating Counseling Materials. And I think these larger ones came from Tema Okun. Um, It's it's the white dominant culture sort of rules. Um, Isolation, grasping for identity, save your identity, making everything about yourself superiority mentality, critical patterns, better than and not good enough, acting and leading in dominant ways, ambition is everything, belief in meritocracy, believing that I must be exceptional to be acceptable, valuing reason over emotion and entitlement and greed. So if if those things are showing in my life, in Misha's life, then those are, those are, uh, racist tendencies <laughs> yeah i mean no, i mean racist tendencies well, there what how, I mean, how do you say it i like uh, to think of it i like to say that it's white supremacy because yeah. i mean people have such a reaction to the thought that they might be racist right and like yeah, 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 oh yeah. then i'm a terrible person like it's not about the personal this is about cultural and the specific ways that the united states has built our systems from Mm. these lenses, right? These Mm. are the lenses with which our systems have been created with which disproportionately advantage white people over people of color and and, and any marginalized person, right? Like, so it's not just people of color, but it's LGBTQ people, um, people who don't have access to wealth, people who haven't had education, right? Like everybody is harmed by these tenants and these rules that we're all operating under, but we don't necessarily have awareness of it. Just like you said. I love it. I yeah. mean, I don't love it, but I love it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm even, it's funny when we say the term white supremacist or white supremacy, it's so charged to me mm-hmm. Yeah, that term that I'm like, you know, can we say yeah. it differently? But if you, if we can take the um, emotion out of it completely and 
Mm -hmm. look at it totally objectively, it's like white supremacy or U.S. Mm -hmm. supremacy or Russian yeah. supremacy or right. China supremacy or, or human supremacy or human over supremacy. nature. Right? I love it. And I if we can, that. if we want to connect that to addiction too, I, I, are you in recovery yourself? Yes. Okay. So I'm guessing the first time somebody may have floated the idea to you that you were an alcoholic, you were like offended, right? Of course. <laughs> yes. Same thing with racism and white supremacy, right? So when you talk about that charge, it's basically it, part part of it is learning to tolerate the truth. And then yeah. part of it is being able to like widen that space within yourself to recognize that it's also not about you. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. also if you, if you are in recovery, I'm guessing you came from a family system that supported the creation of that. <laughs> right. So it's <laughs> yes. not just you. Yes. Right. And yes. so, it, I mean, this is why we use addiction in, in this way, because it's such a direct like correlation, like our white supremacist society is addicted to operating in this way. And then that forms these people, right? Some of us who, you know, act in racist ways that we don't even know it. And then some people who are overtly trying to cause harm, you know, to people that they deem different from themselves. So it's, it's, it's the same. Yeah. A quick, uh, I entered recovery when I was 17 years old, last day of high school. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. Judge Rank said, I can remember Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Judge Rank, you can go to treatment or go to six months in jail. And by the yeah. grace of God, I was like, I, I saw the a life of recovery unfold in front of me and then a life of of addiction and alcoholism. And and I'm still like the fact that I was inspired to choose recovery and it's been yes. straight line for me ever since. Right. That's I, incredible. Yeah. And yeah. Super, the, the stories of people who get sober really early just are so incredible to me. Yeah. 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 We, we'll, we can talk about that another time, but just so you know, sure. like, that's like the lens, like my, yeah. the, the lens that I look through life is, is, is very, it was like a 12 step recovery modality lens, you know, I just, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of fun fact, right? Freaks other yeah. people out, but um, what was I going to say? Uh, but and I'm very active too. I just want you to know, awesome. like, like, yeah, yeah, and and I just say that not egoically, just so you know that there's like some people kind of clean up and then they 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 oh, yeah. they they stay oh, stay yeah. in it through different tracks, right? <laughs> Oh, I know <laughs> those people. You, okay. Yeah. And, and, and just to, you know, reflect back to you, like I can, when we had our first conversation, I could feel yeah. there was a depth to you of yeah. whatever work you had done. And so now knowing that it's 12 step, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. uh, uh what, what was I going to say? I, 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 I'm thinking of, 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 uh, well, two things. One, it's like, the fear of change. So I, right now, like mm -hmm. uh, you have shined a light on something for me. Right. Mm. And, and so now I can go, all right, now the choice is up to me, right. That mm -hmm. ignorance is no longer bliss. Right. <laughs> mm, right. <laughs> for example. Right. Um, and so it's like, oh, the fear of change though. Right. Like what's on yeah. the other side, like as a, as a, well, let's just say human supremacist, Right. Mm -hmm. Like we have a hard time comprehending what would life be like if we didn't mm -hmm. think that way? How if could we, we didn't extract from the earth constantly? Yeah. Right. If, if, if growth wasn't the key metric of a successful. Exactly. Right. And yep. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but go ahead, well, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, go. I mean, it's it's funny that you're saying this because this is the conversation that I've had like four or five times already today that. I think that we're being called to imagine something that's never existed before. And that particular call is terrifying because, you know, it's, it's, it's death in a way, right? Like to get sober and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not sober. I am the loved one of people with addiction. So I, I, I know it from the other side, Okay, but I God can, bless you. <laughs> Yeah, but I can I can really appreciate after sitting with so many clients the depth of fear of having to destroy the person you thought you were in order to become the person you actually are. Mm. 
And I think that's happening both on an individual level right now and a collective level that in order to create a truly liberated, caring society, what we have now has to die. Yeah. And we're in the death throes, right? Mm. Like people who don't want to change, right? Who fear this yep. change are in that death grip right now yes. and don't want to let go. I am hopeful. This is the only way I can live right now is to believe that spring will come and mm. we will have growth and rebirth of something new um, because it really does feel like there's a lot of uh, th threats of extinction happening all around us in, in, in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I have this thought, you know, I, I, I'm constantly writing down ideas for podcast episodes. Like if I was going to go speak on somebody's podcast, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm constantly brainstorming, uh, you know, podcast episode ideas. And one of them I had recently was, was, is your God big enough? Right. Mm. And right. And I think that that's mm. part and I'll try and tie this together, but yeah, but it's like, uh, how do I, uh, how do I want to say this? And it's, I should say it for myself, is my God big enough? Right. I, I don't mean right. to project that out on everybody else, but. Well, we can insert, you know, higher power for God or <laughs> yes. nature, right. Whatever you yeah, want yeah, to insert yeah. in there. The yes. universe. Right. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I just, but what is yeah. it that you believe in? Right. Yeah. Is that big enough? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. absolutely. And then is it big enough to, to, to allow us to embrace that change that you're talking about? And is it big enough to overpower the ego, the human ego, that we are the center of the universe and that like it's very clear to me that many people or there's there's a there's a thought out there or a truth for a lot of people and let's just strip out judgment for a moment that that the universe holds no value if humans aren't in existence right that that the life has no value unless human thinking is around right which Talk so about human supremacy, right? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank right. you, right? So that allow that perpetrates a lot of perhaps destructive behavior, self-centered behavior that mm -hmm. that is just uh, uh, wreaking lots of havoc. So maybe mm -hmm. you want to speak to that for a second, or uh, well, and I think like when you said, "Is your God big enough?" What I think about because we could also insert sort of like values in there, right? For people who are more, uh, you know, removed from believing in, in, in a God, right? So like, what what is your driving value in your life, right? And a lot of people would say very altruistic things, and yet their behavior speaks very differently, right? Like, there are certain factions of, I'm not going to speak <laughs> too directly, but certain factions of our political parties right now that are saying one thing, clearly doing something very different. And so like your values are not in alignment with what your behavior is. Right. And so if your God is big enough, like if your God is care, if your God is connection, if your care is, if your God is humanity, that is big enough right? That is big enough to hold everything. But if your God is power, if your God is money, if your God is status, it's not big enough. Yeah. Growth. Let's throw that in there. Right. Growth, growth. for growth's sake. Growth for growth's sake. Absolutely. Right. Amazing. I think we could go deep down a rabbit hole here, but I want to, I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said, uh, you were like the tenants or I don't know if tenants is the right word, but yeah. you, you, what was the list? You said identity was at the top or no, it wasn't identity. It was isolation uh, and isolation. then grasping for identity and so, then and, save your identity. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what are these what are these things that, what bucket is, are we talking about here? These are like, yeah, the, let me look, um, Tema Okun. Let me look up because it she put it perfectly. Uh Tema Okun's white supremacy culture. And 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 as I'm saying this and as I'm Googling it, a lot of criticism is coming up about it. And that's just where we are right now, right? Like Absolutely. nothing is perfect. Um, but the tenets of of white supremacy culture is basically what it is. And it was written in 1999. 
and right, right. And so, I mean, people have been, it's, it's funny, like, you know, in 2020, white people started waking up to <laughs> racism. And it's like, the, our ancestors have been doing this long before, you know, and <laughs> even that, before, even before 1999, if you can believe it, right? <laughs> isn't that the case with everything? It's like meditation or mindfulness. It's right. like, uh, we just discovered that. this. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's the like extraction, commodification and dehumanization of it is to believe that like yeah. you discovered this, this is new, a new thing. It's oh cute, gosh. right? Yeah. So I want to kind of start at the top of the list and the isolation. So that the isolation, do, do you have, um, because man, we can, uh, as a white man, you know, I had this arc of a ton of success, right? S super successful in sales, you know, grow in the family, this and that. And, and I grew up in Wyoming and I very much had this pull yourself up by your bootstraps mm -hmm. mentality. Right. <laughs> and so that's what I think about when I hear isolation and maybe yeah. that's right. And then I also think, mm -hmm. you know, tend to be alone on an Island or, or right. not, not like it's taken me a long time to really learn how to effectively consistently, uh, communicate for, I, I don't even want to say help, right. but just like, this is where I really am in my mind space right now. If, right. if that makes sense or maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if we think about it, even in terms of like what's expected of, of families, like families that are like white Euro white centered families, we assume that the nuclear family is it. Right. And the nuclear family is supposed to take care of everything. Well, as humans evolved, that's not how it was. There were literally tribes taking care of children and families. Like a lot of nuclear families are really struggling right now because as the world has changed, people have moved further away from their extended families. And so there's less help for kids. There's more people hiring child care. This is not what humans were designed for, right? Like this is the trauma of civilization. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I listened to a podcast once that was talking about the origin of like different like household things like the crock pot and um, <laughs> the vacuum cleaner. But there was a time and I didn't even know this. This was fascinating. There was a time when there was one vacuum cleaner and a guy would drive it through a neighborhood. You would know it was vacuum day and the guy would come and bring this like giant machine into your house and vacuum your house. And the whole neighborhood shared this. Right. And that got me to thinking like we've gotten so far away, like now everyone's expected to have their own car instead of public transportation. Right. You're expected to have your own vacuum cleaner, all of this stuff where like I mean, my husband was out mowing the lawn at one point and and saw our neighbors across the street struggling with a push mower. And so he was like, you can borrow our mower anytime. And they were like so grateful about it. And it's such a simple thing. But I mean, what if what if my whole block, we just decided we're just going to have one or two lawnmowers and we're all going to share them? Amazing. That's like a revolutionary concept, but that's literally how it was before, right? It's oh <laughs> this this God. culture of isolation and convenience we've created, it, right? Like, I mean, we can go down so many rabbit holes with that. Yeah. You know, and even just talking like that, there's going to be pushback from the corporate machine because there's going to, uh -huh. that the answer to that is going to be no, we need to sell more, more lawnmowers. How's that going right. to affect growth? People won't exactly. go into debt to buy more lawnmowers now or remortgage their exactly. house and pull cash out and da-da-da-da-da. Precisely. Um, yeah. Wow, that is awesome. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, too, of the um, of the garage, the advent of the garage, right? And, and even how people now go into the garage, they go through their garage into their house. And so, you know, a lot of communities... It's it's not common for people to be hanging out outside because everybody's going in through the right through the right. I, I, right. Is that true? I mean, I think right. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's very different in different places, you know. And being, yeah. I, wh where do you live? I live in uh, San Diego, California, Encinitas. San Diego. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you you probably have people outside all the time because you guys have the literal perfect weather in the entire world. But yes. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, in Chicago, it's pretty much like it, literally in our neighborhood, we have like tested this theory. If it is under 60 degrees, no one comes out in our neighborhood. But if it's over 60 degrees, people are out and like having a good time and kids are oh. outside. It's <laughs> so really, it really funny. on the weather. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's, it's funny because like we walk our dogs year round because they need exercise and we're like, yes. where are where are everybody's dogs? They're just in their backyard. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it probably depends regionally, but, but yeah, the, there's not like, there's not the expectation to know your neighbors anymore. Mm. And, and I also think, um, you know, part of it is we've sort of, how do I put this without making people mad at me, but it's fine if they're mad at me anyway, <laughs> like there's, there's, there's this cultural expectation for comfort and people think, well, I don't want to talk to my neighbors because I'll be uncomfortable or I'll feel weird. And it's like, okay, to feel fucking weird. Like, I don't, what? (laughs) Go meet your neighbors. And, and who was this? Ah, I can't remember. I, cause I want to attribute this to somebody, the person who said it, and I can't remember it. And I'm so sorry, but it's a woman of color who had written a book about a, a lot of these ideas. And she said like, literally community can save your life. And she told the story of um, a neighbor's house was on fire and the neighbor had a, a developmentally delayed adult child who was inside the house while the house was on fire. If the firemen would have just, you know, blown in there, um, he might not have come out. He might have fought them, right? All sorts of things might have happened. But because there were relationships with neighbors, uh, this this author was able to go in the house and say, you got to come with me now, right? Able to like make it happen lickety split yes. because there was already a relationship online. Yes. But th- we're not thinking that way, right? We're thinking about, I want to be comfortable right now. So I'm going to keep up hold in my, you know, my cozy little cavern. But we, ha- we have to have relationships to survive. Otherwise, we are not getting out of this alive, like literally. Yeah. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh, you remind me of something because I am single and I have been single for a few years now and not dating and more comfortable in my own skin than ever, right? And it was a, a Thich Nhat Hanh, um uh, are you familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh at oh, all? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I can't remember where I read it, but it was an idea that he put out there. And basically he said, like, he's like, look, uh, in effect, and I'll probably butcher it completely, but we can be compulsive with the need for one-on-one intimate relationships. And he's like, hey, mm-hmm. we need to start embracing more community relationships right and understand that we can get that we can fill that 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 need with community it doesn't have to be this Mm one-on-one intimate relationship right and and i love that idea so i've been leaning into that myself so And, you know, it just goes back to what we're talking about, about the isolation of nuclear families, right? And then that also speaks to what is expected of a marriage, right? For one other person to be able to fulfill everything for you. Like, so I I think this is one of the reasons that uh, ethical non-monogamy and polyamory are more widely accepted now because people are recognizing like the way that we were doing family has, it's just not been working. Right. And so communities, yeah. I mean, we're just, we're preaching to the choir and we're saying the same thing over and over, but like community and connection is the answer. I, I love it. Um, again, I want to remind everybody that uh, you've got all kinds of conversations like this on Conversations yes. with the Wounded Healer podcast. So if anybody's grooving on this, wants to hear more, definitely go check out Sarah's Conversations with a Wounded Healer Thank podcast. You. And of course, they can find you at headheartbiztherapy.com as well. Um, and the I'll just I'll put out our other website, the Sarah's.us is okay. where we're doing the the addiction white supremacy work love it yeah that's it's so fun i i um <laughs> it is fun <laughs> it is fun and it I is just, it is i think it it just challenges a lot of norms right now that we're we're getting we're that mm-hmm. we're getting stressed anyways so that's like mm-hmm. yeah let's 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 add to that and um yeah let's add to that my my personal hope for our society for the world is that we can somehow let go of this uh I, i'm a finance major finance degree you know love business all that kind of stuff but but i remember in my college days i was like we are oddly compulsive with this need 
growth for growth, growth for growth sake. And mm-hmm. that, and that can we, you know, now we have the whole debt loop too, like the debt loop of societies, individuals, countries, mm-hmm. uh, municipalities, like, <laughs> you know, to fuel the madness. I don't mean to go down this rabbit hole, but my own hope again is that somehow we can shift from that growth for growth sakes need. And who knows if mm-hmm. and when that'll happen in my lifetime or what have you. But right. um, I, I think it'd be super fun to go down the rest of the tenets and maybe we could save that for a different episode. Sure. But I want I want to dive in a little bit into your into this workaholism and this workaholics anonymous and sure. and, I, and and if I could ask a question in, sure. in that regard yeah great of course so so how was this workaholism manifesting in your life so you've got this business you spent you know five ten years building it um, like what are, yeah how's it how, where's where's the pain yeah yeah this is a great question and. So I guess I can also talk to, because I've been a grateful member of Al-Anon for many years, haven't gone to meetings recently. Don't hold it against me. I'm still practicing (laughs) the principles in all of my affairs. Um, (laughs) Right. I know the lingo. Um, So that that shows you that I have gone to enough meetings, right? That Mm. I know. Um, Right. So it's funny because I, as soon as I mean, I was feeling a lot of pain as a business owner for a long time because of my own codependency and the way that I feel the weight of relationships to which I am responsible. And I would talk about it in my Al-Anon meetings all the time. And one of the meeting members had had said at one point, like he, he was talking about his own relationship with work. And he said, you know, for me, it's not workaholism, but it's a codependent relationship with work. And truthfully, that is what it was for me. But what Workaholics Anonymous did for me was give me more tools to say no and to set boundaries and to think about uh, time poverty and, and just the ways that I was reacting to what I thought was my job. Um, cause it's, it's funny. I mean, my husband's also a social worker. And so we talk about these sorts of things all the time and, you know, he's really stressed and he's like, he's an intake manager. Uh, so he gets like all of the stuff comes to him and he's supposed to like disperse everywhere. And, and he was just talking about how awful is, you know, he's just feeling so awful. And I was like, what do you think your job is? He's like, my job is to get people help. And I said, no, that's not your job. Your job is to direct people to where they can go for help. And like, That was also sort of the shift that I needed to have. And for me, like I didn't have children for this reason because I knew that I wouldn't be able to tolerate being needed so relentlessly. Right. And and that is what kind that's the relationship that often shows up in the therapy field is because it's not just it's not your typical employee employee relationship like we are expected to navigate feelings right and right now the way that sort of the the working world is is that people no longer are willing to be exploited which is great i am yeah. all for that but small businesses are generally not the biggest exploiters, right? We are not Amazon. We are not, you know, these big companies that are like extracting people's labor. Like we're trying <laughs> as much as we can to create equitable spaces, but but employees are showing up in a way as if business owners are extracting from them. And so it's just, it's a really challenging like dynamic to hold. And I'm just no longer willing to do that dance right now. And I'm trying to help other people who are doing that dance, but literally every single business owner, small business owner I know right now feels, feels like they're a bad person because their employees are telling them you're, you're not giving me enough. Mm. Interesting. I, I so that was I, I. We went a little out and around with that. Yeah, but that's that's where I ended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess yeah. Well, I I think and we can talk to this in a second. One thing interesting that you said at the beginning of our conversation at the very beginning is it. So it wasn't being a boss. No, it was being a boss that that was the that was where the workaholism was manifesting so yeah. it was with your your employees it wasn't with your clients and i think yeah. that that's as somebody who's in the therapeutic modalities that is intuitively not what i thought it would have been i thought right. it would have been 
oh my gosh, your your needy clients or said with love, right? Or yeah, of course, or, yeah. Or yeah, you the clients that are pushing right. the boundaries or or right. Um, that would have been the, the, the source of your problem. Um, well, and I guess I just want to speak to that too. In fairness to my staff, of course, every once in a while, there was like, you know, uh, something wild and wonky that happened, but most of it was not like out of control employees. It was really just the dynamic that is created in the power differential between employee and employer in this culture of everyone trying to protect themselves from extraction. Mm -hmm. So you know, when I think about all my employees, you know, there's only a very small number that I actually like think acted out in bad ways, right? <laughs> yes. For the most part, it's real. It was really just more of the sort of like zeitgeist that's been created that I felt I couldn't, I couldn't be, I just, I couldn't tolerate not being able to be seen in a way that was real. And that's why I didn't want to be a parent because I don't want a fucking thankless job. <laughs> I did not want that. I know how hard it was for my mom and I didn't want that. <laughs> that's Simple amazing. That. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wasn't trying to throw your, you, you know, the, the, the employees, your employees. under. The I know you weren't, but I want, if know. they ever hear yeah. it, I want them yeah. to know how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And and by the way, uh, Sarah's employees, as you're listening and hearing this, we're here about helping Sarah take accountability. So that's right. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's oh, I've taken full accountability for all the fuck ups that I did that that also was harmful for them. Yeah, no. And that, I'm assuming that I, I forget I'm, I'm so ingrained in and again, the 12 step or, or the recovery modalities that are mm -hmm. that you lead with accountability, right? You're like, right. all right, what's my part? What's my part? What's my part? So I just yep. assume that everybody's working or talking from that angle. Yeah. And so I was assuming you were speaking from that yeah. angle of, 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 I was the one that was incapable of having healthy boundaries with my employees. I, you know, what were, yeah. what were the ramifications of, of Sarah's actions yep. as the small business owner, right? Precisely. Yep. And, and not pointing at them saying, well, they should have, or if they'd only have, or stuff yeah. like that. Right. Right. Cause um, they don't know. I mean, it is just like the parent child relationship. Like I had a, I had a supervisor once tell me, she's like, you can't expect your employees to like you. The only thing that you deserve as an employer is respect. That's yeah. all that you can ask of them and to do their job, right? Those are yeah. the only two things that you have a right to. Yeah. Everything else, you got to suck it up. Say that again. Say those two things again. Uh, you have a right to be respected and a right for people to get their job done. Mm. Love it. Yeah. Um, so uh previous conversation we had, uh, mm -hmm. you did sell your practice for a healthy little amount, and that's allowed you to 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 slow down, reevaluate. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> you do have some a uh, still a tiny client load of some yes. sort. Yep. Okay. I think about see about six people a week. Awesome. And and uh you had said something else very cool on that previous conversation, and maybe we can speak to it. Um you're like, hey. In my job moving forward, I, I you don't want to like build a business with an employee base. You want to build mm -hmm. it uh, collaboration based. Mm -hmm. Speak to that. What what that's an intriguing idea, like collaboration based. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. Speak to that a little bit. I mean, I think I I don't see myself building something where it's like a boss employee relationship ever again if if i even build something bigger than is just maybe me and one other person it's going to be more consultants everybody being on the same level and then sort of being able to like deploy people to do the thing that i would do if i'm not available right like that's the only thing i can envision right now so that'd be almost more of a collective right sort of contractor based um but I, right now it feels like i am collecting relationships for people who can help me learn the things that I need to learn to do whatever it is I'm supposed to do next. And it's not 100% clear what that is, but, um, I've been working on a, on a book, um, about my own trauma journey and history. I've been approached to write another book potentially about therapists doing their own work and what that looks like from like both a micro and macro perspective. 
Um, I want to continue doing the podcast and having really interesting conversations. I do a lot of speaking gigs, right? It's like, I do all this stuff and, you know, everyone's like, what's the plan, right? Well, that's a very capitalistic question. I don't know. And I have faith in my God, which is like abundance and care and connection that I'm going to end up in the right place. And I'm, I know like, Jupiter is in my 10th house of career, which means that like it's expansive, it's big and it's cool. And I, so I trust, like I've had enough faith. I'm 44 years old at this point. Like I know that I'm going to be successful at whatever I do. I'm not concerned about that. So I don't worry. I just like, I do what, like put my, you know, one foot in front of the other, the next right thing in that moment. And I trust that within the next couple of years, it'll sort of crystallize into what I'm supposed to be doing now. I love it. And I, myself, oftentimes, uh, work without goals and it drives mm -hmm. people crazy. They're like, mm -hmm. what are your goals? And I'm like, well, what if we didn't have goals? <laughs> and right, yeah. and I even hire yeah. coaches now and then and they hate it. <laughs> exactly. I know. I'm working with a consult. I have two consultants and I work with both of them. And one of them knows me really well. And so she gets the goal thing. And the other one keeps going, but, but like, what do you, what are your goals? And I'm like, Christy, let's just show up and talk and things are going to come out of it. I'm dreaming here. <laughs> yeah. I don't have goals. So I have dreams. Yes. There we go. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, having goals or loose goals or it's great to yeah. have a target. I'm, I'm not going to put yeah. that in. There's a time for all of that. Right. But I think having space to test and try and to be able to, mm -hmm. to, to have the room to really pivot or bob and weave or right. however you want to say this can be so powerful. Um, as somebody who, you know, I think so many of us who like this is a new version of me now, right? I'm 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 building my own, you know, business, helping people go on an influence tour and doing these kinds of things and and get their word out there and and guest speak on podcasts and tell their stories, tell their customer stories, all this stuff. And, you know, so I help people that are in that space too of of wanting to grow their businesses. Um, and then you bring an interesting counterpoint to that, right? Where you're like, well, <laughs> it might not be all that's cracked up to be once you get to that space of, mm -hmm. of, of, of thriving, uh, you know, thriving practice. Um, mm -hmm. so perhaps having built that and now sold it to anybody who's listening, who's in this build mode, Maybe give us your top two or three or four things to look out for or to be mindful of or or that you learned from your work in, you know, Workaholics Anonymous or, or you know, slowing down or that's a very sure. broad question, but go ahead. Maybe you could yeah. give us some, some. Well, what comes up for me? So I, I therapeutically practice this modality called NARM, the Neuro Effective Relational Model. And the first question that you ask a client from that model is, what do you want for yourself? And, you know, it's, it's not designed to be like, oh, I want a million dollars or like, I want to be happy, but it's, de it's designed to sort of, um, evoke a state that you would like for yourself, whether it's peace, calm, spaciousness, centeredness, right? Something like, something like that. Right. So whenever I have a new consulting client in front of me, that's, I ask that same question and, you know, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, some of the other things that like, I want money or I want this. And so I, I keep breaking it down and boiling it down until we get to this sort of like state sort of ideal. And, and then that's what I just keep going back to with them. Right. So like yesterday I was, I was consulting with a, a practice owner and she's, I want to buy a building. I want to have a building, you know, we're going through all this sort of stuff. And then I just was like, time out for a second. Why? Because you told me that, work-life balance is what you want most for yourself. And in a rental agreement, you can pull out, you can close your business at any moment and you're good. When you own a building, there's a lot more that goes into it. And so how is this going to impact your work-life work balance? And so I think for any person who is in this like building phase of their business, I would just ask, what is it that you really want? You know, and, and, even people who might say like, I want success, like, well, what is successful? What is actually successful? And as cheesy as it is, like the, if you think about what are you going to think about your own life on your deathbed, right? Like if I died today, 
I know that I would be really proud of the relationships that I've built. I'd be really proud of what I've done in my career that's in the service of helping people, right? Um, that's what I would be proud of. And literally no one on their deathbed says, oh, I wish I would have, you know, made seven figures. Literally no. Well, maybe, maybe there's someone, but they're an asshole. So, <laughs> right. So I guess those are the thing. Those are the questions that I would have people ask themselves first. And, you know, I, I, I just, the people that I see who are getting caught up in the practice, you know, of, of trying to build their businesses, like at what cost is the other thing. And that's the question I had to ask myself at the end of the day, like I'm doing this and yeah, I created a business that has really great reputation, serving a lot of people in the Chicagoland area, a great place for therapists to work, but at what cost to me? It wasn't worth it for me anymore. And and the the price of my exit was what it was worth basically, right? Um so that's the other question, like at what cost are you doing, you know, whatever things? And and it, it depends for each person, right? Like some people can tolerate that employee-employer relationship a lot better. Um, I'm working with another client who struggles with a lot of the same sort of codependent feelings that I had about like, how is this employee going to feel if I like hold them accountable, right? Um, so it, it they're, just keep tuned into like, I think we have to be quiet, right? You talked about meditation earlier. We have to be quiet enough to know what not only our psyche, but also our body is saying to us. And I think it's not an accident. Since I have slowed down, I've been in so much physical pain. And I think that it's like now that I'm slow and I'm recognizing like I have time to sort of feel my body. It's like, bitch, you have been running us into the ground for 10 years and We've been tired for 10 years, but you didn't slow down long enough to listen. And so I'm trying to like recultivate this relationship with my body and be more appreciative and caring and empathetic instead of trying to drive it like a machine. So I didn't ex I didn't give you four quick tips and tricks, but hopefully that like answers the question. Amazing too. Those were two <laughs> amazing, amazing answers to the question. Um, I want to be cognizant of time here too. And and then um quick um Everybody can find you again at your podcast, which is awesome, where you're having all kinds of great conversations like this, Conversations with a Wounded Healer podcast. Is there anywhere else you like to guide people or they can get like a, a free thing from you or something like that? Or, or where's your favorite place to guide people? That's funny. I mean, my my consultant and I were just thinking about this, like what could, what free thing could I do? Cause that's what you're supposed to do right now in the marketing <laughs> world. Right. And I haven't <laughs> figured that out yet, but if you went to the Sarah's.us, you could download our, our 12 step guide and sort of answer your own questions, uh, about how white supremacy cult, how you might be addicted to white supremacy culture, how that shows up for you. So we've got a little workbook there. Um, I like Instagram is my favorite social media place to hang out. And so I'm always, I have a lot of memes and it's kind of all over the place. Like from a marketing perspective, I am terrible because I do the things that they tell you not to do, but I'm just, I'm again, I'm more relationship based and like, uh, I do it based on how I feel in any given moment and it seems to be doing okay. So I'm going to keep doing it. Amazing. And I think Sarah's dot us. I'm guessing that's S -A -R. the Sarah's, the Sarah's. Yes. The Sarah's what a great catchy uh you're on to something with that as a call to action and what a great thing for people to be able to download and um check out and they can yeah. look at where where am I on the white supremacy scale <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's not quite that? that simple but I mean it's very again like a 12-step inventory right of sort of looking oh. at these different places from each of the we we have questions for each of the 12 steps for you to ask yourself Beautiful. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, we've got two minutes and 50 seconds left. Anything that you wished I'd have asked or you wanted to speak to that maybe we missed or? I'm here for whatever was supposed to come up today. This felt great. Yeah, it's been a ton of fun. Um, yeah, amazing. So I know you got to go and I want to be mindful of your time. So everybody, let's uh, thank Sarah Buino, go to the Sarah's, excuse me, the Sarah's.us. Check out her free download. You can 12 step inventory where you are in the white supremacy state <laughs> status. I don't know. <laughs> hey, this has been a ton of fun. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Table Rush Talk Show. 
For resources to help you sell your stuff, go to B-E-L-O-V-E dot media forward slash resources. That's B-Love dot media forward slash resources. And be sure to subscribe, comment, five star, and share. Thank you again for listening.